Oh, good evening, everybody. Thank you very much for coming, and thank you particularly to Jeremy for coming. My pleasure. Uh, we're delighted to welcome you to the El Camino Wine Bar. Ah, uh, yes. Uh, which, is, which is where we have these social events, uh, which is um, uh, everyone can bring their own, the tipple of their own choice. I, I've got the, clearly a, wa a plain water, naturally. Elizabeth's got a nice cup of tea. Yeah. Jeremy, I bet you've got a beer there. No, I have a beer here. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, um, there we are. Um, this is uh, Jeremy Jackman. If you haven't, most people have sung with Jeremy at some point uh, in various choirs over the years. We've known each other for a couple of years, that's for sure. Yeah, and a bit so, more. So, so here we are. Thank you very much for coming. And um, how are you doing? What? Are you, let's start off um, by could you tell these lovely people um, the kind of things you've been doing in the last few years, you know, the, the sort of major responsibilities and, th and then perhaps merge into the, the dreaded lockdown period. Sure. Well, um, I suppose, uh, where do I start? At the moment, uh, I have four, uh, th um, uh, three regular ports of call, as it were. I am the musical director of the English Baroque Choir. Uh, and they are a London-based choir. And I am the chorus master of OSJ Voices, uh, which is the choir for the Orchestra of St John's. And I have a chamber choir in Leicester called the Sicilian Singers. I see some of them um, on my screen in front of me here. Um, and so they are sort of three regular things that um, go into my diary. And then uh, beyond that, um, I uh, also undertake other freelance conducting and uh, writing work. And I do all the other sorts of things that you might expect people like me to do, like uh, the odd little bit of adjudicating here and there, and the odd little bit of this, that, and uh, the other of a musical <laughs> nature, of course. Um, and all of that was um, uh, ticking along quite happily until we got to March, <laughs> when uh, our beloved leader um, made his announcement and uh, basically told the population to go home, go to bed and don't get up until May. Um, I, at least I think that's what he said. Mm -hmm. That's what I did anyway. Uh, well, it's not quite true. Um, but uh, lockdown came as a, um, a terrible shock, of course, to, um, well, to the whole of the music industry. Uh, and um, it seemed a very um, unreal situation in many ways, not least because the weather was so magnificent when that happened. Um, and uh, I'm luckier than some, I think, in that because I have this writing uh, music, the writing arm to what I do, um, I wasn't instantly stuck for something to do for all that time. I was able to bring certain writing projects forward um, and, and other things uh, got done. Um, my garden does not know what's hit it this year. Um, <laughs> I received somewhere around the end of April in my back garden. I went out uh, one day and there was a small delegation. There were two snails and three slugs and they were holding a white flag um, at, because I've been after them this year in a way that I have not been able to be after them for the last 35 years and uh, they don't know uh, what's happening now. And uh, they're all hiding under a very small corner of one bush in the northeast corner of the garden. Um, but it is a fact that the garden has received far more attention this year than it's ever received in the past. Um, and we've actually been eating some of our own produce. Uh, Mrs. Jackman and I uh, enjoy a division of labor in the garden. Um, I tend to be the uh, heavy lifting, the grass, and as far as plants are concerned, if, it's, if you can't eat it, I'm actually not that interested in it. So she does all the pretty looking stuff and, um, and I do the vegetables. And we've eaten quite a lot and uh, we're still here, so I haven't managed to poison us yet. Um, I've done a bit of volunteering for uh, a food bank um, in all this time. And um, uh, the other, uh, there was a sort of musical bonus out of this. North London is stuffed full of musicians. And uh, when we used to do the clapping thing on a Thursday evening for the National Health, somebody sent an email around saying, and would all the musicians perform 
somewhere over the rainbow. My daughter had been living with us during the lockdown. So, and she's a violinist uh, and a very good singer too. Uh, so we went out uh, that Thursday evening and performed between us somewhere over the rainbow. Uh, and it was at that point that it became evident that where all the musicians in the, all the streets around me uh, live. And from that week onwards, we got together uh, to do something every week. This went on for about two and a half, three months. And we would decide on a piece of music. And I would start on the arrangement um, about Monday. And by Wednesday lunchtime, I would be, of course, there's no such thing as rehearsals because we weren't allowed to be in each other's company. So I would post the parts for this arrangement of whatever it was through the various different letterboxes uh, on Wednesday. And on Thursday, uh, we would stand in the middle of the street, to stop, the, stop the traffic, and we'd applaud for two minutes. And then we would, without any so any rehearsal, we would perform this piece of music, whatever it was. Um, and the place was surging with people. Uh, you couldn't, if you tried to drive, drive up and down my, my road, you wouldn't have been able to, um, because it was full of people. And uh, it was brilliant in its way. I'm quite glad it stopped, I must say, because writing these arrangements and then writing out all the parts was actually quite a task. Um, uh, but it was good while it lasted. I've got a professional violinist who lives at the other end of my street called Miranda Dale, who uh, plays for the Britain Symphonia, mm -hmm. and she is just, she's wonderful. So uh, our total ensemble for this, let me think, I had in the end three violins. Uh, it wasn't a standard orchestra, you understand. <laughs> we had three violins, two trombones, a ukulele, a guitarist at number two, and a part-time melodica player at number 37. And I played keyboard and sang. And as I say, we kept that up for about two and a half months. Um, and it was great fun, but I'm quite glad it stopped. It's interesting. So there, yeah. I haven't been entirely idle in all this time. It's very impressive. Uh, um, my mind is following, when you're describing your Thursday cycle, um, it's something I sometimes think about, about classical composers who were in jobs, whether it was church or court, and they, they had, a, they had a, a regular Thursday that they had, they had to provide music for. Yep. And, you know, it did, didn't matter uh, if you wanted to go back and rewrite that bit, it was tough luck. It had to be done by, th and, and the parts had to be copied, and it was all in a gr great rush. Because for, for us in the 20th and 21st century, we look at the printed music and we think it's 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 absolutely a hundred percent accurate. Yeah. Uh, in fact, the reality, uh, especially when they were writing with quill pens and so on, you know, and, uh, was that a dot after a note or did the ink just splurge? Yeah. Um, right. So it you know it's it's a very useful perspective to think that that's how those professional composers were writing. Absolutely. Yeah. I didn't realise this until fairly recently, but Bach all those cantatas that we sing, he wrote three complete cycles for the church's year. Um, uh, we haven't got all those pieces, we've got most of them, we haven't got all of them. Apparently on a Tuesday evening after dinner, he would tuck a sheaf of manuscript paper under one arm and grab a bottle of brandy with the other hand and announce to the family that he was going to go to his study and write that week's cantata. That's how they got written. So they were apparently all written under the affluence of Inkerhol. <laughs> hmm. Well, um, I don't think I've been anything like as productive as you in this period. Um, I was quite poorly back in March with the dream. I'm sorry break. to hear it. Um, um, uh, um, but in a, in a funny sort of way, uh, it, was, it was kind of a good thing because there's always a silver lining if you are minded to look for it. Okay. And uh, I, oh, about three, probably three months after I'd had the, the COVID thing, Matt, that you just met earlier, hmm. um, Matt kept on ringing me up and said, let's do let's do an online project. Let's do it. And I said, no, no, I haven't got the idea. I was, I was sleeping 11 hours a day, you know, with a nap in the afternoon, Gosh. because that's what my body needed. Yeah. Okay. 
and then eventually he nagged me enough times all right well let's do something and it was from that uh, i went from a real sort of exhausted state and probably clinically depressed to be honest because when i when i woke up and i looked around at the world it was pretty flipping well depressing yeah so you know you're sort of allowed to be depressed when it's depressing um and we went for i went from there and when we when we worked out the structure of this camino thing um we went from concept to launch in eight days and uh we the th matt and i my marketing guy mark we worked 12 hour days to get, get everything in place. And right. it was, it was, it was actually medicinal for me. Yeah. I've always been quite a hard worker over the years and, and it, it absolutely perked me up. Yeah. Well, so good for you. Been, it's been, it's been, a, a, it's been a tonic, a genuine tonic. Yeah. Good for you. And so we've got some, most, a lot of these lovely people here tonight who are, um, jo who have joined us and then it's, it's got, more bigger and more complex and we do all sorts of things we do we do this every week this a little chat with the conductor okay <clears throat> because there are a lot of very distinguished and experienced conductors around and so i i, I can tell you that we're just about starting we're starting work in fact tonight just before this meeting mm -hmm. we started our work on the uh berlioz or the shepherd's fair you know, shepherd's all right farewell. shepherd's farewell yeah what a lovely um, piece of music that is and so this is my opportunity to pick your brains and say, you know, what what can you tell us about it? Are there uh, have there been any magical performances mm -hmm. in your life? Have there been any any disasters? Are there any any corners we ought to be watching out for or anything like that? I mean, it's it's musically slightly simpler because it's strophic, but there, yeah. there lies there, therein lies the danger. Yeah, fine. Yeah. Well, um, I, there, there is one abiding difficulty uh, with this piece of music which has to be got over, uh, and that is that uh, a relatively young Berlioz, when he wrote um, L'Enfance du Christ, when he wrote this, the big piece out of which this is a, um, a one excerpt, uh, if he maybe, if he'd been 20 years more experienced when he wrote it, he would have got the orchestra to play a bit more while the choir was singing. Because the big problem with this piece of music is that there's a little orchestral introduction and then the choir sings absolutely unaccompanied for something like 36 bars. And then blow me down, the orchestra play that little introduction again and then we're off again. And I've been to quite a few performances. I've never actually done the whole piece, the, the entire oratorio myself, but I've done the, this excerpt from it several times. And um, it's very rare that in a complete performance, you hear a choir sing this piece absolutely bang in tune. And the trouble is, you know, because you get to the end of your 36 bars and the orchestra can't change key. If you've slipped a semitone in those 36 bars, there's nothing those clarinets and bassoons can do about it. You, uh, they have to play what they got in E major. And E major is a jolly difficult key to keep in tune. Um, so that is the big problem with this piece of music. And the reason it tends, it, by the way, it always goes flat. You'll never go sharp in this piece. <laughs> and the reason it goes flat is twofold. And the trouble is, it is a double whammy. If you, can fi if you fix one thing, but not the other, it'll still go flat. You've got to fix both things. One is that for the sopranos, almost all the phrases fall. The shape of the phrases is a fall. And that tends to make things on the end of the breath, when you've got least control over the sound, that's when it goes a bit flat. And, and it pushes the rest of the parts underneath down. So that's one thing, that's a general thing. The other thing is this, and here I, I tremble and hesitate to talk to you about this because I am no scientist, but there's a bit of science involved in this. I wonder if I, I look at this screen and I see that there are lots and lots of people listening to this. I wonder if any of you people listening are or have ever been a string player. If you have, perhaps you just sort of wave your hand like that. Have you ever been a string player? Okay, well, so there's a few out there who've been prepared to admit it. Well, look, if you've ever put your fingers on a violin or a cello, you will know 
if you were ever any good, that those notes that we think of as being the same as each other on a piano, a black note, G sharp or A flat, are actually not the same. And that G sharp is in fact a little bit higher than A flat. That's a very, very important piece of information, ladies and gentlemen, in the matter of the shepherd's farewell, because G sharp is the major third in E major. And what we know about major thirds when you're singing is this. In standard chords, you just look at my hand for a moment, you've got a root, that's my thumb, and you've got a fifth at the top. And the other element in the chord is a third. There it is, right there, okay. And in major keys, what happens when people sing and they sing unaccompanied, if that third is a bit flat, whoop, I'm just gonna move that down a bit. What happens is that the rest of us move those notes around it down very slightly to turn that thing into the major third that it needs to be. This is why pieces of music go flat. It's death by a thousand cuts. If you're not much good as a choir, what will happen over a four page leaflet is you'll lose about a semitone. I mean, that's what happens. And it happens for two reasons. One is because the general shape of phrases tends to go down. Well, that's what happens in this piece of music. And the other, the major thirds are not high enough. So all the other notes come down to turn it into the note that it needs to be. And E major, G sharp, is a hell of a long way away from E. Do, re, mi, that one there. in E major, that is an incredibly high note. Uh, it's higher than it needs to be. I'll tell you what, run, do a little experiment sometime with this piece of music. Sing it once in E flat major and see how much easier it is. Because G towards E flat does not have to be quite as high to be a good major third as G sharp needs to be when you sing it in E major. If those G sharps are not high enough, it will go flat. And then the next little bit of orchestral material will be a great embarrassment to everybody. Mm -hmm. So good luck. Brilliant. Well, I'm gonna come clean here because um, there are lots of disadvantages of recording things in this virtual world. We know all about them. Yeah. The trick is to try and use some of the cheats or that not not cheats, but some of the techniques that you can use in the virtual world uh, to offset the disadvantages. Yep. And we, we had because our uh, the, the way the project worked is it's a four week step. The name is a step. And so we, and step two was the four, the Arnest Day from the Foyer Requiem. Right. And the middle section always goes flat. Always. So what we did um, when we recorded the audio part of the track, and this is this is every individual member of the, the group sitting yep. at home yep. in a rubbish acoustic yep. with a rubbish microphone yep. because it's not designed for, for music. It's designed for speech. Absolutely. And, and, and see, so we're up against it already. When they recorded their audio, they do it to headphones. So they can hear the backing track in their ears, yeah. but it doesn't come out into the microphone. Yeah. And in the mix of the backing track, we had a piano ping the first note of each bar. And so they could yeah. hear that. And so you they got could something to check the sound against. Yes, it, yeah. which, which you can't have in a concert, but it, it was an absolute brilliant cheat. Because yeah. then, you, then when you, you just take that away and you just hear the mixed voices, it stayed bang in tune. Yeah. And so this, we are doing that in the, in the middle verse of the, the Berlioz. Very good. And what the, the interesting thing about that, of course, is that when eventually all this coronavirus business is passed and that we're all singing once again in our own choirs when we cannot indulge in this uh, clever bit of cheating, um, uh, hopefully we will have got used to singing those bits of pieces of music that traditionally go very flat. We will have got used to singing them in tune. Possibly. So it has that virtue as well. You see, this is, um, I, as I said near the start, I've known you quite some considerable time. And what I've always loved about working with you is your, the practical way that you interpret your musicianship. You are definitely a, a consummate musician, but you, you are a, you have your feet on the floor. 
but if that's a well, I hope I'm saying the right thing. Uh, that's, uh, for, I'm delighted uh, that, that that's uh, apparent. I mean, it just seems to me that what we all need in, in this world, I, I mean, actually, I take, I think a, a medal ought to be struck, uh, honestly, for um, any musician who ever stands up and makes music, but very especially singers, because you are the instrument as a singer. And frankly, it's, uh, if, you, if you've got the temerity to stand up under any circumstances and sing, even if under present conditions it's in your own broom cupboard. Uh, I mean, I think a, a special medal should be struck for singers. Uh, I really do. I mean, it's a very brave thing to do. Um, it's a bit like standing up in public and taking all your clothes off. Um, it, you, you know, I mean, when you, when you sing, it tells everybody everything that it possibly can about you, mm. um, how you're feeling that day. I mean, you can, there's no disguising it. Um, so it's a very, very brave thing to do. Um, and uh, so I think that we're all after practical solutions, Paul. Um, mm. It's uh, identifying the problem is one thing, but knowing what to do about it is quite yeah. another. When I was thinking about this discussion tonight, I was thinking about uh, the, we must have done hundreds of concerts, let's say, or hundred or some. Or whatever. And I was trying to think back and I thought my favorite Jackmanism. <laughs> And it is um, the Rex Tremende from the Mozart Requiem. Oh, yes. Um, because uh, I think most people will know the Requiem. And if you remember, um, in bar four, it goes, bim, bum, Rex, that great explosion of sound. Yeah, yeah. And as we all know, Mozart didn't write all that Requiem. It was written by a junior. And I remember in one performance, you telling me that the opening four bars, which is the instrumental introduction, which mirrors the choir entry, were filled in by Zussmeyer. Yep. And on the second beat of the first bar, the, the strings go, ba, ba, two yep. quavers. And then on the second beat, there's a wh whacking great big wind entry with basset horns and trombones. It goes, Bah. Yeah. Um, and it's, uh, we, we all became accustomed to it. And uh, you came along and you said, no, 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 Mozart didn't write that. Zussmeyer wrote that. And by doing so, he took away the impact of the choir entry because it's the second time it, it, it comes within four bars. That's right. And so when you hear bat, bat, and this fantastic fortissimo silence, then but up, but up, but up, but up, but up, but 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 then it means something. Absolutely. And uh, so uh, the Brandenburg parts of the Mozart Requiem have that chord absolutely indelibly crossed out. So even I'm if delighted to know it, even if conductors come along and say, "Well, why aren't you playing that crotchet?" They say because we can't read it. Oh, good. <laughs> that's excellent. So that I'm is sure that that's is my, right though. That that is that was your gift to me, and it's it, it's always remained. I mean, you know, it's it's a tiny thing, but it's absolutely classically an example of, of your practicality combined with musicality. Well, I'm I'm delighted uh, that that uh, that should be the case. Actually, uh, uh, perhaps if we're talking about the Mozart Requiem, I can tell you about one other circumstance where I've just had a little nibble at trying to make something come right. In the tuba mirum, um, the bass. It, basically, the individual singers, all four of them, have a, a solo each, working from the bottom upwards, and then they sing as a quartet. Uh, and you remember the bass starts, tuba mirum spargenza, uh, and there's a trombone solo. Uh, that, and it's, it's really a duet, actually, for the bass and the trombones. And what is clear from the score is that it was Mozart's intention for the trombone to keep playing all the way through the movement. But actually, Mozart only managed to finish the trombone solo as far as the end of the bass solo. Well, so um, the gentleman that uh, Bob describes as his junior, Sussmeyer, um, he realized that it needed to be completed, this thing. So he had a go at completing. So he wrote a bit, of, bit more stuff for the trombone to play over the tenor solo. And uh, he realized, actually, that he just wasn't capable of uh, making a good enough fist of this. So actually, once he, once he got to the end of the tenor solo, he simply stopped writing. 
Well, over the years, well, I, I, every time I've conducted the Mozart Requiem, I thought it, it gets to the alto solo and she sings and the strings are just sort of chuntering away there. Chink, chink, chink. And every time she stops singing and the strings are doing that, it's almost as if we're all looking round saying, surely there's something missing here. Well, the answer is there is. <laughs> Someone's miscounted Mozart. their bars. Yeah, right. OK. And over the soprano solo and over the quartet. And it got to the stage eventually about, I don't know, seven or eight years ago, where I thought, I've got to do something about this. Uh, so um, I got in touch with St. Peter uh, and I asked if I could uh, just have 10 minutes of Mozart's time. Um, and he said yes, most unexpectedly. So uh, at a prearranged time, I was sitting in front of my screen, as I am now, uh, and all of a sudden there's Mozart, you see. And uh, uh, he said to me, this is most inconvenient, he said, I'm conducting the Heavenly Orchestra at the moment uh, and they're playing my Jupiter Symphony. Uh, oh, and by the way, he said, I got Colin Davis playing timpani and he's making a terrible <laughs> mess of it. Anyway, uh, uh, that's beside the point. Uh, so I explained to him that I wanted to know what the rest of that trombone solo should sound like. At which point he was even more annoyed, Mozart, because he said, well, surely it's absolutely obvious, he said, but if you're such an idiot, I'll tell you anyway. And he told me what it should sound like, and I scribbled it down on a piece of manuscript paper, and he went off to complete his rehearsal. Um, and whenever I've done the Mozart Requiem since then, um, we've done it with the trombone uh, player playing all the way through that movement to the end, um, uh, playing uh, clearly what Mozart act actually intended. Um, from the bit where he stopped to the end of the movement. Um, and I've always thought that the acid test of whether actually that's any good or not was whether anybody noticed. And the answer is hardly anybody ever notices, except, of course, the trombone, the trombone player certainly player. does. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yes, what is all this? <sighs> yeah. Um, but there we are. So there's another little uh, ring. Mm. Um, lovely, lovely. Uh, well, this is this is fantastic.